be seated. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Father, thank you that you promise us that there, where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. Lord, we welcome you amongst us today and celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our hearts so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. We ask all this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. I think we've got the Kirk Singers now. I'm backwards today. Happy Spring Day. All right, our first reading is from Psalm 47 today. It's a psalm of praise. Let me see. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God is King over the nations, God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather at, as the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. That is the word of the Lord, the poetry of the faithful.
So did that sound like happy? Those words are happy, aren't they? So if you were going to teach these people here, because we're all old and kind of stodgy, could you teach them what it really means to clap your hands and shout to God with loud songs of joy? Can you show them? No? Can you get up? Oh, come on. When you're really happy, what do you do? When you're really, really excited about something, what do you do? Jocelyn, you're going to Disney World. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> I hope that's not the reaction my child has. Any, any? What? Well, imagine if that were true. Just imagine. Can you imagine? Are you really happy? Were you happy to see the sun out today? It was feeling a little bit warmer. Are you tired of winter? You're really tired of winter. Do you know spring's coming? Yeah. And you're about to have spring break? Can you show me happy? All right, I'm just gonna have to flip it here. Is there anybody here happy about the prospect of spring?
Good morning. Let me take a minute to thank you for coming. Um, today, I'm an intern here, and I'm going to assist Pastor Bob today. He's not in our midst. He's having a, a vacation. So, Our second Bible reading is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 1 to 11. I read. It was now two days before Passover and the festival of unleaved bread. The leading priests and the teachers of religious laws were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. Do not, but, during the, but, do, but not during the Passover celebration. They agreed on they agreed that the people may rout. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from essence of night. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of these, some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume? They asked. It could, be, it could have been sold for a year's wages, and the money given to the poor, so they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her? for doing such a good thing to me. You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could, and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth. Wherever the gospel's news, the good news is preached, throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples, went to the leading priest to arrange to, to betray Jesus to them. They were delight, delighted when they heard why he had come, and they promised to give him money so he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. This is the word of God. A couple of weeks back, I sat down with Pastor Bob to plan my internship, training at a wonderful and lovely church like Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church. I knew why I'm saying this. This is my second internship Place. My first day here, Bob had, had not even officially introduced me to the congregation. Two young men of my age walked to me, walked to me, introducing themselves and thanked me for coming. That was a warm welcome that I have not received for a long time. It made me feel belonging. Many a times, such warm greetings always comes from the elderly. And immediately after the service, one of them came to me again for the second time and asked me to drink coffee with him in the fellowship hall. As we entered the fellowship hall, two elderly came to me and introduced themselves to me. And through our conversation, they found out that I am here for my internship. They willingly wanted to help, and they asked me if they can show me around. Wow, that blew my mind. I found it so strange. Just first day in a place, the people don't know who you are, 
and they open their hearts and hands to welcome you and make sure that you will feel comfortable with the place. The reason I'm saying all this, I want you all to know you are doing a great job here in Mount Vernon, welcoming people. I experienced it and I am very thankful for it. And I encourage you all to keep on doing it. And God will richly bless you and the congregation. I am making my story very short. Bob assigned me a preaching immediately, immediately asked me if I want to add another preaching and Bible studies to my calendar. I find out immediately that Montfena had a culture. And the culture is to welcome and make you feel comfortable. Bob asking me, tells me that his will was to help me in my ministry. Hearing the stories from many of my colleagues, getting a single preaching day in an internship is a struggle. And in my case, in Mount Vernon, I have been asked if I am willing to have more than one. That was very strange to me. After I received this passage from Bob, it reminds me my first exegetical paper in the New Testament class. Many of my colleagues I, and I choose this passage to write on for a exegetical paper. We have in mind, in our minds, it was easy to deal with. It happened that we were going to drive into a brick wall. The story in this passage is one of the stories that are in all the four Gospels. Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. And the difficulty with this story is that the story is one story told in four lenses. And they aren't told in the same way. In the Gospel of Mark and Matthew, the event took place in Simon the leopard's house. And in Mark, Matthew, and Luke Gospel, the woman's name was never mentioned. After reading all and pondering over them, there is one thing that stands out in Mark's gospel for me. In verse 6 of the passage, Jesus said to, the crit to her critics, the ladies' critics, the women's critics, leave her alone. He has done a beautiful thing to me. This was Jesus' response to the women's critics. Let us picture this day. We are all in heaven with our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says to you, you have done a beautiful thing to me. What kind of reward is that? This morning, we are going to focus our minds on the significance of the beautiful thing the woman did to Jesus. The woman showed her deepest love of worshiping Jesus in a very extravagant way. For Mark, there are three things going to happen to Jesus in this story. He is going to be betrayed, arrested, and abandoned. Mark starts his story of Jesus' death by telling us the timing in verse 1. It says, now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away. Jesus' anointing happened two days before the Passover, and Jesus is killed on the third day after the plot and his anointing. When one examines this, the whole story, it is well-constructed story from a professional storyteller. He begins this story with the plot to kill Jesus. The story ends with the plot to betray Jesus. 
And in the midst of the plot, it also tells us that a woman came in to anoint Jesus. It tells us that the leading priests and the teachers of the religious laws were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him, but not the Passover, not during the Passover celebration. They agreed on that the people may rout. So to avoid that, they did not want it to happen during this time. The story ends when, Jesus, when Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, who knows Jesus very well, went to the leading priests to arrange to betray Jesus to them. They were delightful when they heard why he had come to them. They promised to give him money, so he began looking for an opportunity to betray him. And in the midst of Jesus in Simon's house, there comes in the room an unnamed, devoted woman who will give Jesus her extravagant love. This story is very simple. It tells us three things. Action, reaction, and defense. The woman anoints Jesus with a very expensive perfume. That is the action of the story. The disciples complained she is being wasteful. That's their reaction to the action. And Jesus coming to the lady's aid is the defense. Jesus defends the lady, defend the lady that they should stop criticizing her. If we look at verses three, meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon. A man who previously had leprosy while he was eating. A woman came in with beautiful alabaster perfume made from essence of nail. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. In those days, any where men were gathered, whether they are dining, talking, or communion, women and children are not supposed to interrupt unless they are called to serve or clean the place. This woman was not supposed to be there in the first place. She doesn't belong to Simon's household, but she is impulsive, and she doesn't care about her out social behaviors. The perfume was very expensive. As the story tells us in verse five, the disciples said this, said that it's worth more than a year wages. It is recorded in many Bible translations that it's worth more than 300 denarii. In those days, there was no way for a woman to earn that much money, to buy this expensive passion. This night would have been a family property that has been passed down from several generations. All it could be the whole family's treasure. That would have been very important to her. The story tells us that, tells us the woman did not just pour out the knife, the perfume on Jesus. He broke the jar. Means no perfume left in the jar. This is a total gift, completely done. The men, in the, the men in the room, probably including his disciples, were indignated and very irritated at the woman's extravagance. Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year wages. And the money given to the poor, they rebuked her harshly. In the Jewish tradition, giving money to the poor is the right thing to do. The rich People sharing their money with the less fortunate people of the society is a use, it's a good use of money. The men saw the woman's extravagance as waste. She has just thrown away more than a year wages, 300 denarii. They did not get it. And this made 
them very things. They did not understand her motive of doing what she did. And they still had no answers why she did such an outrageous thing. But Jesus knows and answered them, leave her alone. Why are you criticizing her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth. Whether the good news is preached throughout the world, whenever the good news is preached throughout the world, this, world, this woman deeds will be remembered in disguise. Do we all realize how significant this is? This beautiful thing is part of the gospel today. Gospel to be told. He has done a beautiful thing to me. I'll tell you the truth. Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told. Jesus is saying here, Wherever the gospel is preached, this story must be told too. It is, a practically, it is practically as important as the gospel itself. And beloved children of, the God, of God, this is what we are doing. We will reflect on the deeds of this woman today. What this woman did is a teeny picture of the gospel itself. The sacrificial love this woman lavishes upon Jesus points us to the sacrificial of Jesus. It also teaches us the way that we should respond to Jesus, the way we should worship him. There are three significant things I want us to emphasize on. The powerful of, a powerful of devotion, a normal sacrifice, and extravagant worship. The woman is motivated by love. Jesus clearly sees this because he himself made his sacrifice out of love for us. He was not under any obligation to die for us. He did it, willingly motivated by love. Even while we are sinners, who cannot do anything good for, to him, he did it for us. At the time, Jesus had already told all his disciples about this upcoming death, yet they could not understand him. But the woman saw the shadow of the cross laid heavily upon Jesus. She is a follower of Jesus. She guessed it. When Jesus spoke about his upcoming crucifixion, she knew immediately that Jesus came to this world only to die for the sins of the world. She knew that he was going to die for her sins too. Therefore, to show her act of love and devotion for Jesus, she broke the alabaster jar and poured all the fragments, perfume on him. A most costly possession. Nobody encouraged or commanded her to do this. It is just something she took upon herself to do. And she did out of her strong devotion to Jesus. He was overwhelmed with love and lavished this expensive perfume. She poured out all her heart, praising Jesus, honoring him, in effect worshiping Jesus and sacrificing to him. At that time, the disciples probably know Jesus is going to die, yet they can't comprehend it. But to the woman, she sees the shadow of the cross lying heavily upon him, Somehow, she understands what Jesus has said about his upcoming crucifixion. 
in a way that none of the disciples do. She knew, she knew that he is willing to die for the sins of the world. She knows that he would die for her sins too. So in an act of love and devotion, she breaks the jar and pour all the fragrant perfume, her most costly possession. She breaks the jar, pour all the fragrant, her most costly possession over his head. Nobody tells her to do this. In fact, this is not commanded. It is just something the woman takes upon herself to do. And she does it out of her intense devotion to Jesus. She is overwhelmed with love. Lavishing this expensive perfume on Jesus, she is pouring out her heart, praising Jesus, honoring him, in effect worshiping Jesus and sacrificing to him. This morning, as we meditate about how to organize church, how we should organize our length, how we should go about our length, we are all concerned with the truth and the right beliefs. This is important because there are many things that we may fight with. We are worried with right behaviors. This is a good thing as we want to show how to live differently from the world. However, we need something else. And this is what the woman showed us. She showed us the heart we need. A heart for God that responds in an unintensifyingly personal way. We, do we lack this devotion? This will be my question. This right emotion and feelings, as we dedicate ourselves to Jesus in this land, have we engaged with all our hearts? When we are growing up, many of us were taught We should be careful in life not to be carried away with our emotions. You were taught to take it easy and be moderate. You were taught to behave in a proper way. Showing intense more emotion is awkward and uncomfortable. Knocking at our neighbor's door and asking them how they are doing and sharing the gospel with them in our cultures I often see as awkward. Shameless, abnormal to the status quo. Sometimes even we will be criticized or looked down on. Being lavish and emotional in our devotion is usually unaccepted. The disciple taught this woman. The disciple taught this woman was not out, was out of his mind. They criticized her because he was emotional and she wasn't moderate. But she was not burdened with the apprentice. She was not afraid of the public judgment. Her love frees her from that fear. She was not afraid to show her emotions. Her love was so great that it needs an exceptional act of devotion to express her emotion. For this, Jesus praised her and considered her better than Simon and his own disciples. What about us today? What about the way we worship God? Are we free from fear? Are we afraid to break the tradition? I know that many of us here today love Jesus. 
as God where as God's word is preached into our hearts, we respond with thanksgiving. However, are we overly concerned about the right order and the right behavior? Imagine if this woman joined us now in worship. What would you, what would be your attitude to us? Maybe there are some here this morning who doesn't have the intense love for Jesus. You may be, you may be feeling spiritually dry and far from God. Perhaps we can't remember the last time we responded to Jesus with a powerful devotion. You might not even know Jesus personally. May this story encourage us this morning to go home, pray that Jesus would give you this love. Ask him to refresh your dry hearts, to give you the same powerful devotion as this one. Ask the Holy Spirit to transform our daily worship from being moderate, controlled response to one of intensive affection and devotion like this one. We are all aware and know Jesus' sacrifice was enormous for us. In response, the woman sacrificed her incredible expensive perfume as a token of her love and devotion to Jesus. She would have sold it for a large amount, just as the disciples thought she should have done. It is wealthy more than one year's wages. As I'm preparing this sermon out of curiosity, I Google to search for the most expensive perfume. And here was here it was. It was priced $222,000. This is a lot of money. One can use this, this to buy a small townhouse in our area and a single family house in Greensboro, North Carolina. Wow. Does the woman know what she was doing? I think all of us will say, she did not, but she knew what she was doing. I think she does know what she was doing, but she did not care. Her love for Jesus is so great that she is not concerned about the cost of this passion. I believe that at the moment, she, she adores what she is doing because this is her only chance to reveal her intensive devotion to Jesus. Jesus is about to die. She probably, probably isn't thinking about herself, what he's gonna eat tomorrow. She doesn't care about the consequence of giving away the costly perfume. She is more concerned about Jesus are we concerned about Jesus during this night? She wants to sacrifice more to him and only wishes that she would have more to give for an offering to be meaningful. It is going to cost us something. You must give up something that is value to us. For example, we all like to rest at home on a Sunday morning to watch our favorite shows. But the very fact that we are all sitting here now, this shows our appreciation. This shows that we 
value worshiping God together, fellow, following and hearing his word. Worshiping God involves sacrifice. Sacrifice of money, energy, time and pride. In fact, wholehearted worship demands everything we have and everything we are. These disciples are concerned with themselves. They wanted to be great in the kingdom of God, sitting next to Jesus on the throne. But the woman isn't concerned for her son. And the thing she gives away he is concerned for nothing but Jesus. And in that, Jesus says, she has done a beautiful thing to me. In fact, in that, he is already achieving greatness through her devotion to Jesus. The disciples suggested that the money could be given to the poor. They were indignant because they don't understand the motive, her motive. They thought the Lord has commanded them to love their neighbor, but they don't realize that to do this, they must love their Lord first. When Jesus is telling them, the poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. He is telling them to sacrifice to him first, as he is the one who is about to be sacrificed on their behalf. Have we grasped the greatness of Jesus' sacrifice? What is your response? It is one of the intensive love and devotion, like this woman. Do we need to come back to the foot of the cross and see this beautiful sacrifice that Jesus has that Christ has willingly paid for you and me. No response or sacrifice of ours is too great. Nothing we do could, over, could ever compare to what Jesus has done for us. Once we love Jesus with all our heart, my soul. We will live for him and to give all that we are. Thinking on a practical way, what is one thing that you are willing to sacrifice to Jesus, for Jesus this night? The woman action was extravagant. Not out of necessity, the disciple don't object to the perfume. What they object to is the extravagance. This is ridiculous, wasteful, even sinful. The disciples want the money to be put to good use. They want something practical, as we do in our lives. True, feeding the poor is a good way to use money. It is even a respectable thing to do. But useful, usefulness and being practical isn't the most important thing in the universe or in God's kingdom. Usefulness shouldn't replace God. Jesus is our, is our Lord. And God himself is a strategy. God gave us an extravagant gift in the person of Jesus Christ. Whatever it was wasteful, outrageous gift. Why would God give us? Give away his perfect son for soiled people, ungrateful sinners like you and me. We should ask ourselves. Jesus is wealthy far more than what we deserve. Jesus gives everything he has for us. 
He gave his life and he gave even more than necessary. He died for the whole world. But the whole world doesn't affect him. This wasteful life is God's act of divine love, divine sacrifice, divine extravagance. God's way is out of order. Jesus has shown us what a total sacrifice. He, he breaks his body and pour out all his blood to save me, you, and to save me. Is it wasteful? A teeny little jar of perfume, only a token of love for the woman to give back to show her gratitude. What a beautiful thing she has done. pointing us to the smell, the fragrance, Jesus' sacrifice. This bottle of perfume presents the gospel of salvation for us, so it is no longer wasteful. It is no longer wasteful. It is worth every single drop. How do we worship God? Is your worship extravagant? Are we worshiping God just like this woman? Have you even done anything extravagant for Jesus? Have you even been so bold with love that others were calling for it? Have you ever done anything so outrageous for Jesus that Others thought you were out of your mind. Often we think that we are so reserved, too worried about what others will think about us. We don't love Jesus as, as much as we should. We are too concerned with ourselves. We find it hard to understand what it means to do a beautiful thing to Jesus. But God has been extravagant to us. He has lavished on us the riches of his grace. He has given us things we all don't deserve. And more than enough for us to as I bring my sermon to close, please let us all reflect on our lives during this Lent. How should we respond to God, to God in worship? With a powerful devotion, with an enormous sacrifice, and an extravagant worship. Then Jesus Christ said, she has done a beautiful thing to me. What about you? Thank you so much. Let us pray. Merciful God, gracious Father, we thank you for your word. Please let us love you and please give us the strength to demonstrate to all that we love you like this woman. Everywhere we are in our homes, job places, communities. This is our prayer. We thank you for hearing our prayers. In the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ, and the congregation say, Amen.
nursing scholarships in her honor. If you haven't paid, come and pay at the door. Cost is for the price of a luncheon. It's a joyful uh, event, and uh, everyone is invited. She was a sitting elder and died as a sitting elder and had a congregational prayer here. Wednesday at Fort Belmar Officer's Club from 12 to 2. Did you need? I want to ask for the prayer for Russell uh, and his team The congregation, as the scriptures say, anytime two or more meets in the name of the Lord, He is with us. As a congregation today, this shall be our prayer. For Charles, David, and John lost their mother. David, lost of mother. This shall be our prayer that these people be found the throne of God. He has called them home. It's difficult upon us because we have lost them. We ask for his mercies. To fill our hearts for this explanation that He has called them home. And to bless us that we may stand in all time. For Barbara as a niece, what a rejoiceful. Is going to have a niece 
Let's have a joyful moment. He has the standard of authority. We ask that this lady, the mother, will have a safe birth. And this child should bring joy to the family. And this joy this joy will be a joy that will help others. Not the parents, but every child of God who experience this joy. Father of heaven, we lift up John for your throne. We ask that your promise that you said nothing is too hard for you. As we speak as a congregation, May your healing power fall on people. <coughs> Betty is recovering. We are joyful. We thank you for his life. That you have re-energized her. And he will come and join us. To say we thank you. We ask for traveling mercies for Russell. That's your promise. You said you know from A from the beginning to the end. And you know from the end to the beginning. We ask as a congregation that you bring them safely to the place and bring them safely back home. And what they are going to do in your name will come to fruit that we can we, we all get together and say that thank you, Lord. The congregation, I will ask us all to stand. That all these people, I will give everybody a minute to say something in his heart. As a true worshiper. Bless them. Bless them. <coughs> Say something that will be a blessing in their lives. From your heart. We also ask God, as a congregation, Mount Vernon, what does he has for us this year? He, he should guide us that we may not waver. We will see and we will experience that he is with us. That this gracious gift he has given to you welcoming people, that this all the pool be filled with people. 
and they will be saying hallelujah to the most high this will be our prayer and we will pray like how he taught us to pray the last prayer our father our father into your house also be blessed because you have been marked with the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go and rejoice.